tonight, um, we'd only be able to begin to address the challenges that our healthcare system faces. And we've been talking a lot about those challenges over the past uh, two days. So first, it's a system in which the participants in the healthcare continuum too often operate in silos, instead of in a connected and coordinated fashion to provide care to patients. Second, it's a system in which millions, in which participants in the healthcare, oh, I lost myself, in which millions of patients have multiple chronic conditions, requiring multiple physicians, nurses, specialists, pharmacists, and many other providers, and these conditions aren't necessarily treated in a holistic manner. Third, it's a system that's reactive instead of proactive, devoting greater resources to treating symptoms rather than preventing and managing illness. And finally, it's a system in which one of the greatest resources, the patient, is not empowered to have a significant role in his or her care or to play a role in ensuring positive health outcomes. So as we look at these challenges, we see a common thread to a solution, and that common thread is information. So to the degree that we can place reliable, meaningful data in the hands of each player in the healthcare ecosystem in a timely and secure manner and respectful of the patient's privacy, we think we can make a reactive system proactive, make a fractured system more connected and coordinated, and make a system geared to treat one illness into one that addresses every aspect of the patient's health, and we can change the patient from a passive bystander into an active partner. And we have here today a panel of people who are doing just that. So what we want to talk about today is the progress we're making towards what some would call the holy grail of healthcare. Sharing health information over networks that can seemingly integrate uh, health IT systems in thousands of hospitals, clinics, pharmacies, and practices nationwide? Are we moving towards a platform that can take all of a patient's health information and place it in the hands of each healthcare provider who is part of that patient's coordinated, connected treatment team? And finally, can we give patients, especially those with chronic conditions, real-time access to their healthcare providers wherever they happen to be? So today we're fortunate to have considerable expertise and thoughtful insight into these issues. And I'd like to introduce our panelists. First, we have Alexandra Walford. Alex is the uh, Marketing and Business Development Manager for Cryptic Corporation based in Portland, Oregon, where she manages the market definition and go-to-market strategy of patient engagement products and services. She came uh, to Cryptic from Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield's e-business division, where she was an analyst for Regents' member portal, MyRegents.com, and most recently was the product manager for My Blue Community, a national health and wellness community uh, that currently reaches about 20 million members across the country. Next, we have Dr. Christopher Beal. Dr. Beal practiced practices general medicine at St. John's Internal Medicine in St. John's, Michigan. Dr. Beal also practices inpatient care at Sparrow Clinton Hospital and is a clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine. As you'll see, uh, health information technology has been integral to Dr. Beal's medical practice and his training. His introduction to patient care with electronic medical records began as a medical student in 1997, and he's worked to ensure that patient quality and engagement are a top priority in his office. Next, we have Dr. Julian Safran. Dr. Safran is a native Washingtonian who received his medical degree from George Washington University. He completed his residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the George Washington University, and he's board certified in obstetrics and gynecology. He's also an assistant clinical professor at George Washington University School of Medicine and has been leading his practice in changing the patient experience. And finally, we have Nimesh Javeri. Nimesh has been with Walgreens for 23 years, starting in New Jersey as a pharmacy technician and then becoming a pharmacist. Since then, Nimesh has held 
a number of roles within Walgreens with ever-increasing breadth and responsibility, leading to his current position as the Executive Director of Pharmacy and Healthcare Experience for all of Walgreens. He Mesh is the holder of four federal patents in pharmacy technology and methodology, and he has six additional patents pending for pharmacy practice and design. So thank you very much to our panelists. We're very pleased to have you here today. So our format is each of the panelists is going to speak for 10 or 15 minutes, and then at the end we'll have questions uh, from the audience. So with that, Ramesh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Paul. Well, it's an absolute honor to be here with all of my colleagues. Uh, one of the things that we've been hearing over the last two and a half days is a lot about healthcare and technology. But the one area that I haven't heard a lot about, which represents about 12 to 15 percent of the expenditures of U.S. health care, is pharmacy and pharma. And what are pharmacies doing and what can we do to integrate with the physician, the hospital systems, and certainly the health plan? So what I'm going to try to give you is a little bit of insight of where we're going and what we're doing to try to change pharmacy practice in the U.S. Uh, but before I do that, I might, might want to give you a little bit of an overview of the company. Uh, I think most of you have probably heard of Walgreens, small little drugstore, 8,000 locations. Uh, it's a great way to give somebody a directions. Uh, go to what first Walgreens corner, get, make a left turn, go to the next Walgreens, make a right turn, and you're there. So, but that, all kidding aside, we are America's number one pharmacy retailer. We fill 20% of the U.S. prescriptions, retail prescriptions. Um, two out of ten prescriptions uh, are filled out of Walgreens. Uh, so let me kind of give you a little bit of insight on our company. You know, we are a little over a 110-year-old drugstore chain. And yes, there is a Mr. Walgreen, and uh, we have Kevin Walgreen that still works for the company uh, as a pharmacist. Uh, we started as a pharmacy and continue to be the primary driver of who we are. But just to give you an idea about some of the innovation that we've done in our company, over the last 110 years, you can see some of the innovation that's been done in our company. Uh, amazingly enough, the most famous innovation is that we actually invented the malted milkshake. <laughs> Kid you not. Um, uh, and just a, a little trivia, we actually terminated an employee for not putting the banana in the banana milkshake. Do you have any idea who that is? Lucille Ball. <laughs> Thank God we fired her. She went out to have a nice career. But that is a true story. Um, but everything from child safety packages to now uh, acute care, episodic care clinics in the stores, um, and we're doing that today. So who are we? All of you probably know us as the corner drugstore. This is who we are. We're a complete healthcare solution. Uh, and I'll go into the next slide and we'll give you an idea of the numbers behind all of this. But everything from community pharmacies to mail service, uh, we have online and mobile solutions, which I'll talk about today. Uh, specialty pharmacy, we're the largest infusion and respiratory services in the entire country. Um, as well as on-site pharmacies, worksite pharmacies, and then our in-store clinics. Um, to give you an idea what this foundation looks like, uh, we're in 8,500 total points. 75% of the U.S. population live within five miles of a walking drugstore. Now, why is that important for us? Because one of the things that we're trying to address in this country is access. Well, we will beg to differ and say access is already there. The question is, what are we doing with the access? And how do we leverage that access? We're number one in worksite and health uh, clinics. Uh, so corporate campuses, um, big deal for, for uh, corporations to reduce absenteeism and to keep employees healthy. Uh, we have everything from occupational therapy to physical therapy to pharmacy to acute episodic care to nurse practitioners to physicians on site, part of Walgreens at our corporate campuses um, across the country. And as you can see, we're number one in health pharmacy systems. Uh, why is that important? We're located on 110 hospital systems that uh, the pharmacist works hand in hand with the physicians and the nursing staff to ensure that the patient care is comprehensive and, and holistic. Um, and so on and so forth. But here's the big number. We employ 73,000 healthcare professionals from pharmacy technicians all the way to physicians. Uh, we're a large employer of healthcare providers. The question really becomes how do we start to integrate all the information together? 
So brick and mortar is only one part of what we offer. Um, where we're going is to match up the brick and mortar with the mobile applications that you see today and you hear about. So let me give you a little run through of exactly what we're going after and what we're doing today. Um, this is a picture of one of our new stores in North Park, Illinois, which I'm actually going to show you a video of what this looks like. Uh, but we have a new position called a health guide. It's a patient navigator. Uh, one of the things that patients continue to tell us is the healthcare system is complex. We need help. More than a physician and a pharmacist and a nurse, we need a resource that will answer questions from what's my benefit design look like? What's my Medicare Part D program look like? Is this covered or not? Will that OTC product actually interact with my prescription? Here's what my doctor told me to get. Is this right? Those are the questions that today patients aren't getting the answers all the time. How do we address that? So these health guides are actually equipped with mobile tablets. Uh, they have access to every information that you need within regulatory guidelines. So if Mrs. Jones is at the counter uh, or at the uh, drug wall and is asking about Robitussin, they can pull up that information for that patient's uh, prescription history. And if there is an interaction, have that individual be seen by a pharmacist rather than taking that Robitussin home and having a severe reaction when they get home. Again, try to capture a situation before it happens. We introduced last year pharmacy chat. For the first time, there was a chat program, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, where any patient can simply log on to Walgreens.com and chat with a pharmacist. And you say, well, why would anybody want to chat in the middle of the night with a pharmacist? Uh, you ready for this, folks? 500 chats per day. Everything from, I, I take these five medications, do they interact? Two, I just dropped scolding hot water on my son's hand while heating up his milk. What do I do? How do I take care of this? What should I use? These are questions that are being asked by text because, again, as we all learned this, year, uh, this week, everybody buys a smartphone, uses a smartphone, uses a tablet, and it's near and dear to them. So, again, we launched this last year to great success. Here's a funny little story. We actually had a pharmacist uh, overseas uh, that we traced the IP for that was using our pharmacist in the U.S. to obtain information so he can then provide that information to his patients in Pakistan. So, global society, small world, right? Uh, but these are the types of things that brings healthcare together. Refill by scan. Again, patient, uh, prescription adherence in this country continues to be a close to $300 billion issue. It also is the driver of some of the readmission rates that we see in hospitals. So how do we make it easy for patients to simply refill their prescription? They can scan their barcode that's on their prescription bottle, indicate which store they want to pick it up anywhere in the country, and it'll be ready for them whenever they choose they have it ready. And here's the great part. If they choose, we can out, they can also look up their entire patient profile right on their smartphone. And when that prescription is ready, you know what? Can you text me? Sure. We'll text you. Not only will we text you, we can email you, we can call you, we can leave you a message. All seamlessly behind the scenes. Um, trying to help patients navigate through the system a little bit easier and make prescription filling or their medication obtaining a little bit easier for them. So what does the model of the pharmacy look like in the future? Uh, this will give you an idea of what the video I'm going to show you. We have about 160 of these new stores in the ground now. Uh, and hopefully some of you had a chance to go into some of these stores. But we offer everything from preventative services to diagnostic testing to acute episodic care from, uh, from take care nurse practitioners. We have a collaborative care physician when necessary. And of course, our pharmacist on, on site. You know, we talk about accountable care organizations. Here's a new word that I'm going to give you, or a new phrase. Let's start talking about accountable care neighborhoods. Because an accountable care organization at the end of the day is in a facility. What happens when that patient goes into the neighborhood? Where is their clinician that they're going to be depending on to, to receive that care? 
So this gives you an idea of what it looked like, or what we envision it to be looked like. So let me show you a video of what well at Walgreens looks like. Again, uh, a little over 150 stores in the ground. Um, this takes nine regulatory changes to actually what, uh, do what we're going to show you. Uh, believe it or not, the number one issue of why we can't move pharmacy practice forward is regulations. Regulations don't allow us to move the profession forward to create that collaborative care model. So uh, with that, if uh, our gentleman in the back can uh, roll the video, please. We do silent movies too. So while they're fixing the technology, let me give you an idea of what this store looks like. Um, the traditional drugstore, for the most part, when you go into a drugstore, you'll see the pharmacist in the back. And as a pharmacist, I can say this affectionately, but their primary role has been to lick, stick, and pour. The question is, is how do we take that out of that role, take them out of that role, and put them in a more patient-facing role? So the pharmacist actually is no longer in the production area in this pharmacy. In fact, you can't even see the medications in this store. One of the things that customers and patients told us pretty loud and clear is don't make it about the product, make it about them. So what we've actually done is hidden the entire production area of the pharmacy department. Uh, and the, the pharmacist actually does all of the work on that prescription, whether it's a clinical check, dosing check, or the actual product check is done virtually, either through their mobile tablet or on their desktop. So they can do it anywhere in that store. Um, as well as what we've done is we've centralized a lot of the things that they do today. So the phone calls don't ring in the store, uh, all of your third party billing is not done in the store, as well as the data entry on any of the prescriptions is done at a central location. Again, providing that clinician the ability to actually spend time with that customer rather than and, and that patient. As well as uh, they have all mobile tablets in, in the store from the technician to the pharmacist to the health guide where they actually are speaking to the patient uh, through and with these tablets and these devices. Um, why are we doing this? What we've seen in the initial 150 uh, uh, stores is that patients are speaking to their pharmacist on the average 42% of the time now. Um, if you ever go to a pharmacy, when's the last time you spoke to a pharmacist? Raise your hand. Yeah, three, four, five, six hands went up. Think about what's happening with the growing of America and the continued increase in chronic, uh, chronic conditions. Uh, these folks actually need to speak to their pharmacists to ensure that the therapy is correct. So what this allows us to do is to put the pharmacists actually out front so they're in an office-like setting, uh, up front, available and accessible by the, by the patient. And then right next to them is a consultation room uh, fully equipped for um, uh, any type of electronics, any type of demonstrations, all done in that pharmacy department. Uh, fully connected to our uh, take care operations with a nurse practitioner, so th those clinicians have full access to that type of information. Uh, 
So you'll see this, and folks, if, if you can't work the, uh, the audio, if you just roll the video, they can see the video. But the profession has faced many challenges in achieving this goal, and for the most part, it has not been realized. Little progress has been made. Cost, in various ways, has been the greatest challenge. No approach, regardless of its merits, is likely to be adopted if it increases in any way the cost of health care. Walgreens has analyzed this issue in depth. We have learned, for example, that 37% of the typical pharmacist's time is spent doing tasks that can and should be performed by a pharmacy technician or cashier. Letting pharmacists be pharmacists again is the key. The way there is both simple and revolutionary. We need to rethink and reinvent the community pharmacy from square one. Introducing the new health experience pharmacy at Walgreens. This new kind of pharmacy is patient-centered, it's comfortable, professional, and inviting. It's fully interactive, more useful, providing products and services for prevention, management, well-being, and acute care. It's also high quality and safe. So how do we get there? We use a redesigned space, new tools, and new roles to offer Americans a path to better health by making healthy living an everyday experience. Here are some of the highlights. People are more likely to begin a health conversation in a warm, calm, professional environment. Seeing the frenetic production area isn't compatible with that. The best health care happens when a patient interacts with a pharmacist. So if we're going to move the profession forward, we have to move the pharmacist forward. Put the pharmacist where the patient's are. The pharmacist must be able to provide new services and a higher level of care while still executing all of the traditional responsibilities of a pharmacist. Give the pharmacist new tools, training, and other support. The definition of pharmacy should be broadened to include a wide range of healthcare services, such as immunizations, health testing, education, medication therapy management, and acute care. Make healthy living an everyday experience. This is how patients and pharmacists will experience the reconceived pharmacy. The pharmacist will sit at a desk adjacent to the production area, easily seen and accessible to patients. The pharmacist will have easy physical access to the production area if needed by the pharmacy staff. Rather than being on a raised platform looking down at patients, the pharmacist will be at or below the patient's eye level. This makes patients feel more comfortable with approaching the pharmacist. Many administrative tasks, such as phone calls, data entry, and third-party billing, have been centralized to improve quality and keep the pharmacist patient-focused. The pharmacist will be able to supervise technicians utilizing numerous digital cameras that can be viewed and enlarged on their workstation monitor. The technicians will fill and process prescriptions in the production area using state-of-the-art digital imaging technology. The pharmacist, who remains patient accessible outside the production area, completes the final check of the filled prescription on screen using the images created by the technician in the filling process. The pharmacist will be in close proximity to a private consultation or health services room that is highly professional and comforting to patients. In trials of a new design, patients were four to eight times more likely to speak to the pharmacist than they are at current level. The new environment is more comfortable and less stressful for both patients and pharmacists in order to foster a comfortable and low-stress interaction between them. One of the pharmacist's new tools is the Health Tablet, a consumer-facing device used to enhance consultations with personal profiles, medication guidance, health goal setting, and more. When appropriate, the pharmacist will be able to walk with the patient to the nearby guided merchandise aisle to advise the patient on over-the-counter medications, food supplements, and other health-related products. Other new features, such as our health guide, the health explorer, and rapid refill kiosks will direct patients to the pharmacist for consultation when necessary. For decades, the pharmacy profession has talked about a new professional vision for community pharmacy, with less emphasis on filling prescriptions and more on providing health care. Today, Walgreens is doing something about it, by taking the necessary steps to bring patients and their pharmacists closer together to improve each patient's medical outcomes and overall health. The evolution of pharmacy as envisioned by Walgreens will improve quality without increasing costs. 
It will also provide better, more effective health care, which should reduce readmissions and overall utilizations in the long run. These innovations are good for patients, good for the profession, and good for the overall health care system. The key to the future we all want is to let pharmacists be pharmacists again. That's the new health experience pharmacy at Walgreens. Thank you very much. Paul? Thank you, Nimesh. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Julian Saffron. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, this slide, sir. Um, my name is Julian Saffron. I'm an OBGYN and practice in Washington, D.C. And I have Walgreens on the left and uh, Centricity and Cryptics to the right of me. And you're going to get a very different perspective. As a matter of fact, I wanted to say thank you to Assurescripts and that I'm awed by the work you folks are doing. And you'll see the way I'm making the patient experience in IT work is really trivial. So part of it, I was thinking, what am I bringing to the table today? A couple things. One is I've been doing this for 30 years, so I've gone through a multitude of different, oh, here we go. I've gone through a multitude of different um, experiences and exposures to IT, several different um, computer systems, and also I have a huge need. A lot of these folks have figured it out. You folks are figuring it out. I'm having a lot of trouble figuring it out, and I can use your help. So let me just go through what I do now. And uh, I am somewhat embarrassed that it is so trivial, but it works. I, that, you know, the folks on Yelp, when I get my letter from Yelp, we love you on Yelp, it's patient experience has been positive. But I'm doing it in a very uh, simplistic way. We do have electronic records. And I was just going to go through briefly what my day is like, how I use IT, uh, just to give you some background, what, where I am lacking, where some of these other folks have figured it out. I get up, I look at my emails, regular old email. It's not encrypted. I get emails. I give every patient my email address when they leave uh, the office um, because I don't have the portal set up yet. Uh, and they, I get a ton of emails every day. Obviously, the benefits of email, which we all experience, are huge. Um, I have, I'm in D.C., so people are emailing me from Afghanistan. Um, they're um, emailing me in the middle of the night when it's not an emergency where I can respond easily in the morning. I don't have to deal with a hold button. They don't have to deal with a hold button. It's just fast and easy and been very effective for me. Um, a lot of the uh, responses are people do need prescriptions. And what's great is I have short scripts, I have an EMR. It doesn't matter. I could be at home, it could be the weekend. I can pull up their chart, make sure that everything that I need to check on has been done, send that prescription when appropriate to the drugstore. If I can't for some reason, because it's not appropriate, it's really easy for me to respond to the patient. Um, and I think that's a big part. I mean, when I get emails back and comments back, it's that the patients are really happy that they got a response quickly and it was much less painful than their typical medical experience had been. Another is I get an email, they need an appointment, and they could be in, you know, Iraq, or, and it's just so much easier and better for them. I can then pull on my EMR. I just schedule the, you know, they give me a couple of dates. I schedule the appointment. So these are just ways over the years. Again, it seems somewhat trivial, but it's a huge difference from what I had been doing. Um, you know, test results, uh, I'll go through that a little more, and that's one place that uh, I do have the ability for a patient portal. But what I end up with a lot, <coughs> and a lot of the patients have trouble using the portal that we have through the lab. It's not through our EMR, is uh, they, you know, even though I gave them my email and I said, why, you know, when you want your test results, if you are this patient who has this insurance, we send it to this lab, here's how you get the results, here's the way to do it, another way to get results from other labs. Uh, frequently they email me wanting a copy of results or having a question about results, and it's just as easy for me to accomplish. And also medical information. What I've done 
And I, these things exist commercially, but I have hundreds of topics as OBGYN. They're limited to that, where I can then email patients something that I've reviewed or written that explains and answers their question. Uh, the other things I do with technology, again, it's really trivial, and that's where you folks can figure out how to make it better. I have an iPad. I have just PowerPoints on, you know, for young girls, uh, ways to uh, help decrease the risk for sexual assault. The folks uh, 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 from Rain made that for me. And I feel like, God, this, if I can help them reduce that risk, smoking cessation. So it's really, all it is is simple PowerPoint, and it helps me with workflow, and I feel that it helps give them information they need. And it's, again, it's not, you know, IT at its peak, <laughs> but it's basic, simple IT that works, uh, that you folks can improve on. Uh, I give the lab access out, and I'll show you one of those, and I also give every patient my email address. So this is one of the... Um, uh, tools that I use. So QuestLab has made a, uh, uh, an app that works on all devices and certain of my patients, most can use, I send the lab to Quest so they can access their results electronically and it's, it's not as seamless and easy as I'd like it to be. M many of my patients, I mean they have mobile devices, they are sophisticated, they still find it difficult. <laughs> So, uh, and I haven't figured out, nor has the lab wanted to figure out why, where the glitch is. And so what are my frustrations and things that I'd love for, I, and I know some of these things exist, but I'd love to have help solving the problem. Uh, I'm in a group now of 120 doctors, so to implement a patient portal uh, like the ones that you're going to hear about, I just can't say I want to do this. The IT folks, along with the board, has to decide that they want to put the money out and do it. So I'm patching things together, uh, and, and I need help making that work better. So the things that I love, oh, Google Help. I had given out and done a ton of work. This is a frustration related to you folks in technology. The lab said, you can connect to Google Help. And I go, God, all my patients use Gmail. This is great. I went on the computer, got him a username, gave him an instruction sheet, did all this work, uh, handed it out, had like 3,000 patients signed up for Google Health, and Google said, you know what, this isn't working for us, we quit. So I go, oh, thank you very much. I finally spent time and effort and got something to work, and the support, I used to love Google more than I do now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, I, you know, they do no harm. They didn't do harm directly, but it sure made my life difficult. Uh, I cannot do, and I, you know, the airline industry, almost everyone can do online appointments. I'm not sure what our problem is in healthcare, but I would just love for patients to be able to make and cancel their own appointments. Again, trivial, simple stuff that we in medicine, maybe somebody here has done it, but I can't get it get done. So I would love for something to work there. Uh, and it's also hard for me, again, I'm not, I'm working with an EMR that's sophisticated. I am not sophisticated and I have limitations in the tools that I've been given. So for me to follow the rules, this is just showing how difficult it is if you're using email alone to comply with what the AMA says you should do. And I'm sure I don't comply, but then I say to myself, okay, here's the balance and the benefit versus the negatives. I do it the best that I can. So um, I appreciate any help you guys can give me <laughs> in making uh, my ability to take care of patients work better. This graph is looking at the number. There are 13 compliance guidelines that the AMA said one should follow if they're using emails. And this is the percentage of the people that follow how many. So 20% follow one. You know, uh, how many, you know, follow them all? It's a tiny percentage. Thank you for sharing your experiences, Julian. Chris, thank you.
<laughs> well, thank you for your attention this late hour of the day. I really want to make my lecture a little bit of a teaser. I'm a general internist. I practice uh, adult medicine. I also have a very large internal medicine practice inpatient, so I'm doing actually hospital work as well. And then the surprising piece of that, too, is that I actually have a geriatrics population. I'm taking care of those in the nursing home. Those are all kind of three continents for a physician nowadays. To do those are impressive, I think, maybe sometimes overwhelming. And then the neat piece is then they have an IT hat on top of that. Are you ready with my slide presentation? All right, very good. The goal today was to talk about the role of how we've enhanced our clinical workflow through the technologies that you've all given me. And I think we've come up with some very new, unique and very interesting uses of that. Get the right clicker. So we completed the Patient Center Medical Home in 2010. Patient Center Medical Home is a very challenging set of uh, structure that really does ask us to engage our patients. And I think that's really what I wanted to show you is how we've been successful in that. We began that process in 2008 and completed it successfully in 2010. done so since. Actually, on Thursday of this week, I have my inspection with the uh, insurance company that's been leading that pilot. And so we're going back to, uh, to show them what we've done in these years. We've also completed meaningful use. That stage one completion was June of last year. We plan to complete year two of meaningful use just a few weeks from now. I'm going the wrong way. So I had a very interesting, and I think just quintessentially great comment come about four weeks ago. And one of my patients said this. He says, you know, having that patient portal is kind of like having an old-time doctor do house calls. And I stopped. I dead my tracks. I just kind of set down my mouse. I backed away from my keyboard. And I said, tell me more about that. What about this has been that engaging to you? So said, well, it's this. You know, I have my parents, my mom and dad are your patients. And if we have questions, we're able to message you. And you get that. In the city, in the state, in D.C., or wherever you have to be traveling to, so we're confident we can get that message to you. And if it's not urgent, we are very pleased with the response time. And she said, secondly, you know, I have my mother-in-law in your practice. And she's in our home, homebound. And so I have to bring her to every encounter to be able to say, hey, you know, she's behaving a little different trying to get a urine analyzed. And that's been wonderfully helpful to our family, and we appreciate that. I said, good. Can I use that in a presentation? Because I think it's important for the IT world to hear. We did a, a 360 renovation of our care cycle in the office. So everything we do from analysis to delivery and then return visits has been looked at. And we're really happy with that. We do a quarterly pre-visit pre analysis, gap analysis, to see who has not been in, who has deficits of care. We use that then to guide an outreach. We do that electronically. We do that by phone. We do that by carrier pigeon if necessary. I've sent certified letters to those that really didn't have any of those responses. And then we complete a scheduling process. We actually have them equipped to come back at the time that's most convenient for them. If it's a fasting lab I need for a diabetic to complete a cholesterol profile, I have them through in the morning when they can get that before breakfast and then go off and have a morning meal. Then each patient arrives with an agenda. They actually have a menu that really serves as a guide for that. Uh, that sets our directions and our common goals. We use that then to summarize what we've done in the encounter. If they've left my office, they get an automatic summary. That is followed up by communication. They handle securely and recordable. And uh, done then to both relay information as well as to allow for that feedback loop of saying, hey, did you understand this? And I tell you what, I've enjoyed it thoroughly. I'll show you that my colleagues have as well. Uh, there's an amazing statistic. I looked at my numbers for CMS for our meaningful use, and it shows me it being 94.1% of my patients having electronic access back to me. Now, that's not the case for all of my office physicians, but I think that's a neat piece to just so show when there's a physician that's engaged, the results are rather profound. So what are we? I mean, we're a very small clinic. I want to make sure I made that point. Uh, we have one physician who speaks fluent IT, and I'll tell you that that's me. I have a physician, and I actually got caught by the word processor. It's uh, another internist who has 30 years of practice, and he's missing his index finger. His concept of typing or data entry is very different from mine. And so his typing skills and his reluctance to use this product have been somewhat pampered to. I and mean, we've given him a chance to use the technology, to know it, to see it, to get to trust it. And I tell you that today he's actually giving the same satisfaction that's helped his workflow. So lastly, I have a family physician who's never, done or never produced a paper chart. And that sounds simple, right? You say, okay, sure, yeah, she's a new doc. And that's true. What I think is very unique about her case is she's actually not a first career physician. She went back to med school at 50 and then is actually doing this as a second career. And so for her, she's not a native email user. She's not fluent in IT. 
But yeah, she's able to muddle through this. And to be honest, she said the same thing. Is really, this does the thinking process for me. I'm back to just being a physician. I can talk to my patients. And I think the example that I would give is how viable that physician-provider effort is. When you have a physician that is willing to engage the patients, you hit those high numbers, a 94% plus engagement level. And I think that's a message I want to make sure I give to my colleagues is there is value to that. It makes my day simpler. At 5.30, I'm able to shut the laptop and I go home with completed charts. My referrals are done. My prescriptions have been completed. I don't have hours and hours of paper chart management. At the same time, it's very easy for me to get on the computer before I come to a lecture like this, before I get up and head to the office, I can check my agenda for the day. And that has been an incredibly big solution to the gaps in care that we had before. And to have the patients engage that is a wonderful piece, so thank you. Thank you, Chris, and we'll end with Alex from Cryptic. Thank you. Hi, everyone. First, thank you all for being here. It's five. You guys are troopers. It's awesome. So um, if you're not familiar with Cryptic, we are a healthcare data exchange and connectivity company. And we primarily make products for providers to help them meet meaningful use requirements and to facilitate care coordination. And we are actually, little known fact, owned by SureScripts as of a few months ago. So we're partnering really, really strongly with them on the clinical interoperability network, which I think Harry mentioned yesterday. So, so why patient engagement? You guys have heard of patient engagement, right? Yeah, so patient engagement is pretty important right now, particularly for providers. But the way that I think about this is that patient engagement isn't an end in and of itself. It's a means to an end, right? Engagement does not translate into action. So I'm a big fan of the patient activation measure. And I promise I'm not selling it. It's actually sold and marketed by a company called Insignia Health right now. But it was developed at the University of Oregon by an MD, Dr. Judy Hibbard. And it's a great way to think about how patient engagement can translate into action on the part of patients. So this is the grouping for patient activation. And we've got some percentages here, and I found these in my research on the Insignia Health website. And I think they're an estimate of what the American patient population is in these four categories. And if assuming that they're accurate, right, and that the high end of the ranges are accurate, that means that 40% of the patient population is a level one or two. That's kind of scary because that means that they don't have knowledge or confidence in their own health recommendations that they're getting from their doctors. So it's really important that we run some interventions here and connect with those patients. So recently the NEHC released this framework, which I really, really like. I think it's awesome. I think it's an, an excellent way to map online tools and tactics to certain stages of patient engagement, and they've very conveniently mapped it to meaningful use. So Baseline, you have to have a point of access on the web, right? Or on a mobile phone, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But you have to inform your patients in some capacity. Wayfinding, give them directions to your practice, give them your phone number, give them some forms to print out. But that's pre-meaningful use. So if you're not there yet, you're way behind the curve. What's really awesome about this framework, too, is that it takes us out to what we might expect in meaningful use three and four which I have it printed out here. It's pretty long. There's a lot of stuff here. So um, it's important that you start now. Get your website up and running. Get your patient portal up and running and start talking to your patients. So what goes into a patient portal? So I think there's really four things a patient portal needs to do to be engaging. And this is not just a meaningful use. I think the ultimate purpose of a patient portal is the data that came out this week, that 31 million Americans are receiving care from accountable care organizations right now. That's like 10% of the American population. That's way beyond Medicare at this point. So you have to have a way to communicate with those patients, but because without activated patients who are knowledgeable about their healthcare recommendations, who are confident enough to follow those healthcare recommendations, also known as care plans, I want to stay away from too much of that jargon, but ACOs will fail. They're not going to be able to manage their own care unless they're sitting in front of their doctor. 
So the interactive patient portal needs to have self-service tools. It needs to have something that patients can do, right, when they come to your website. And this is not just about clinical information. This is about the stuff that patients want to take care of quickly and easily, like paying their bill. I came from the Blue Cross Blue Shield, and I used to work on the member website. And we, as you know, as a health insurance company, we're working really hard to get our patients, or we call them members there, get our members to come to our website and read health and wellness articles and look at our transparency and cost tools. But in order to do so, we have this philosophy where you would hook them with these transactional site elements, things that were convenient, that made their lives easier, so that you could introduce them to transformational content. So I've kind of kept that same mentality. You've got to give them things that they can do that are valuable, like secure messaging, appointment scheduling. We have the ability on the cryptic patient portal for patients to request an appointment, reschedule an appointment, cancel an appointment, ask a doctor a question, request a medication refill, and pay their bill. These are all transactional things that patients need to do, and if they can avoid picking up the phone, that is a great start. So two-way communication is critical as well. We need the ability for doctors to communicate with their patients on the web. It's low cost, right? Some of the challenges to date have been that the reimbursement models haven't caught up, right, to e-visits. But patients want to interact with you in a convenient and quick way. Like Dr. Safran said, they want to send you emails in the middle of the night. They want to send you emails and communicate with you when it's convenient for them. But they have to get a prompt and timely response for them to keep coming back and using these tools. Personalized care management is also critical. And this goes beyond just general patient education material about diabetes. It needs to be specific to the patient and their individual needs and preferences. And you have to spend some time figuring out what those are. Another note here, and this is also left over from my insurance background, you have to speak their language. You have to give them care recommendations and care plans and tools that make sense to them. They have to understand it, right? And of course, I think it goes without saying, we're all here because of the fourth box, mobility and ease of access. There's a lot of interesting research on the mobile context, and it used to be we thought people were on their mobile phones when they're on the bus, commuting to work. That is not the case. They're sitting on their couch watching TV on their iPhones. That's just what they're doing. And what better way to make it as easy as possible for your patients to reach you than to have all of these tools available in the palm of their hand whenever it occurs to them to take a look? So. It's absolutely important that anything you do in a web-based portal is also available on, on the mobile phone. So this is the cryptic patient portal. And I promise you I'm not trying to sell it to you, but I'm obviously pretty familiar with it. But it also happens to be really patient-friendly and easy to use. And when we were redesigning our portal, which is actually the portal that Dr. Bill uses also, and I'm very proud of this 94% utilization, that's excellent. When we were designing this, we really tried to focus on the user experience. We wanted to make it very easy to see what was available the minute that you hit that URL. There's no ambiguity here. You can pay the bill, right? You can send a message to your doctor. You can look at your medical records, all really high value things that a patient can do on the website. And we have it on the mobile phone also. So, What's really important when you're thinking about your mobile patient portal strategy is that it's not about taking what's on the web and then slapping it on a tiny screen. You have to design specifically for mobile. You have to think about the mobile environment. And you have to capitalize on the features that the mobile phone has that the laptop and desktop don't have. Like real-time GPS directions and the ability to call directly from the map when you're totally lost and you're going to be late for your appointment. We've also streamlined the amount of information that we offer here, so it's just the really critical stuff you need to see. You can access your medication list. And I wish those were real pictures of pills, and maybe that'll be in a future version. You can actually look and see what it looks like. But there's all the information you need to know about your medication. 
So in the event that you have a referral, you go to see a specialist, and if for some reason, and I can't imagine this happening, all of your complete medical history didn't make it over to the specialist before your appointment, you have it right there, very handy, to show your MA or doctor at the time you're going to your appointment. So care management is also incredibly important. And this is actually um, a scorecard from one of our products. It's called Care Manager. It's a population management tool. And this is a diabetic patient. We're able to package up all of the tests, exams that she's overdue for and send them directly to the portal. So she can view that at work, on her desktop, or on her phone. So right there, the doctor's got some extra revenue coming in just by looking and seeing, oh look, Sarah hasn't had a foot exam in seven years. <laughs> Hope everything's okay. And it's also not just about the portal. It's every touch point with your patients to make their lives easy and convenient. And this is an example of our online e-signature technology for collecting patient signatures on consent forms, demographic information, med history questionnaires. So you can send this to the patient before the visit. You can present them with an iPad when they come in for the visit. It's just a great way to keep reinforcing with your patients that you're a tech savvy practice and you guys use technology often, so go online. We'll communicate with you there. And of course, what would a presentation about patient engagement be without a mention about social media? Now, we don't sell social media services, and I mean, I could probably informally advise you, but this is one of our um, customers, Dr. Jeff Livingston out of Irving, Texas, and his practice is MacArthur OBGYN, and this guy has got it down when it comes to social media. He has such a committed following of patients on Facebook. He recently started a Pinterest board too, where he'll put up like pictures of nursery ideas or baby shower ideas. And his patients love this. They love cultivating this relationship with him. And he understands that this is where they're spending a really good chunk of their time. And what better way to really engage with your patients than coming to them and meeting them where they're at? So, like I mentioned, 31 million people are receiving care from ACOs. So patient engagement is really critical. There are a lot of tools and techno technologies out there now, mobile, web-based, you know, capitalizing on social. So I just encourage you all to think about you know, what you're doing to help doctors. Who here is a doctor? Cool. And for the doctors, think about what you're doing to capitalize on these technologies for your patients. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. So now's uh, the time uh, for uh, any questions that you may have. But maybe to start things off, I was going to ask a question um, probably for Chris and Nimesh mostly. So, you know, when we talk about patient engagement, Alex talked about some of the things, uh, you know, mobility, ease of use. But I mean, if you have 94% of your patients that are using the portal, I mean, what's the experience? Do, do they all say, cool, I got a link, I'm done, I'm off and using it? Or, you know, what words of advice would you have for, for the audience in terms of what they can do to make sure, because it takes more than you just providing that tool. What else should they be thinking about in that regard? I heard a comment was made earlier this day, and it was basically that physician of fear. If I give them electronic access, they're going to page my left hip off. And you know, that's been the opposite experience. It's been a reassuring thing. It's like the old familiar blanket for a child. When they have that thing that's understanding there is access, they don't overuse it. But it's been reassuring to know that if there's a question, easy to communicate. Uh, I can send educational materials. I can respond to inquiries, provide pieces of the confusion of an everyday patient encounter. And just that mediation through the portal has been amazing to the physicians in my practice. So simplicity, not a lot of training in your part. It's just simplicity for the patient experience. Yeah, I was encouraging them to get on it. I said, listen, I want to engage with you that way. I'm going to be traveling more. I'm going to be speaking to events like this just to help take the message of what we're doing here to doctors, to help them be empowered. And so don't be well armed. You know, you're still able to access me. And to be honest, that's exactly how it's been in the office. Difference between your demographic or your geriatric patients 
patients versus your younger, more tech savvy patients? And there are microphones in the middle of the room. So All right, so uh, let me restate that question. If it wasn't heard in the back, uh, the question was, what's the difference in the demographics between my patients and my geriatrics patients? And I actually should, I kind of chuckle when you ask that because I actually have an average age of uh, 67 years old in my practice. So that's my median age. So I'm not exactly taking care of a young population. I have that smattering of 30s and 20s, and I kind of go, why are you here? I'm an internist. You know, I really don't have a lot I can help you with. At the same time, I really enjoy those people because it's simple, simple things. Um, so I would tell you that that was one of the questions I'm often asked is how is it that those people do engage with you? And I'm amazed. The littlest grandmother that you would never think has technology under her belt is doing Facebook with the grandkids. She's doing Christmas cards from her smartphone. And she's doing an amazing job of interacting with me on that. Um, I have several I manage are coming in that way. I can anticipate that by 4.30 I'll have a response to my 1.30 email and I can just sign that off as a day's task. We don't have to call her. We've completed the loop by the end of the day. And that's very rewarding. My geriatric, my nursing home population is how I would term that. Um, I think that my 65-year-old plus population educates me and I love that patient population. They're not geriatric in my mind. My nursing home population is harder. That's usually a proxy. It's a caregiver. It's a son. It's a daughter. It's sometimes out of state. And that's really neat to keep them in the loop. You know, they're able to say, hey, mom's apparently having some changes. The nurses are calling me more. What's going on? So we can dialogue. And again, that would be to me, hours of phone call. You know, it's hard to have the interruption of my day to say, hey, I'm going to take a 45-minute phone call. But to dialogue back and forth, it's easy and seamless, and, and it's been simple to us. Hi. Um, thank you. That was uh, all very interesting. Um, and, and I think the whole, the whole um, the phrase patient engagement is, um, um, I mean, there's many sides to it. Um, and it sounds like um, the solutions that you have and that you're happy with um, seem to be engaging patients um, in their care from an administrative level, for the most part. Um, I mean, they can pay their bills, they can book appointments, they can reschedule appointments and that kind of stuff. And, you know, they can see their health information. But I wonder how engaged they, okay, so I'm asking, how engaged do you feel they are um, in their actual care as a result of having that access? I mean, you know, knowing their record, they were there when it happened. They were there when all these things happened. So knowing that record on their device probably isn't necessarily the most useful thing. Some kind of a sense of whether it's goal setting or progress or, you know, next steps and looking forward. But what do you think is happening there at the moment and where do you want it to go? Can I answer that one as well? I don't want to steal the conversation here, but I love this topic. Thing for us is our patients are upset when they can't have it at their specialist. When they say, Doc, I know you have a good record. I know we've worked together in this partnership to make my records accurate. And it's frustrating when we get to another specialist that we know is also on a very high quality EMR. And so we've built that piece. You know, we've, we've, we sense the need, we sense the urgency. And so we're in the final stages of testing of our, um, our RIO, our Regional Health Information Exchange. We'll be both pushing and pulling that information. So that'll be labs, hospital, imaging. Um, we'll be able to have a full CCD, you know, HL7 exchange of information. And so that will be not only in or out of the hospital, but in and other clinics and then back into my office. The, the neat thing is the, the structure that I have through SureScript really allows me to do even med reconciliations through that piece. And so we're, we're really excited about what that will be in the very near future. And I'm sure the same holds true. Of, you know, with the email, most of it is not administrative, but most of it is a person asking me a question about a problem that they have. So they have a specific issue. Their email is, you know, yes, sometimes it's for an appointment, but most often is here's my problem, uh, and frequently I want to call them. I, I can't do real-time discussions, but uh, it's it's not administrative. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You just um, Mike Arrigo with uh, uh, No World Borders, and I write for uh, Health IT News. Uh, you just mentioned something that's really key to the it's sort of the backhaul of the patient portal, which is uh, the HIE and the CCD. And um, in digging around through the CDA standard uh, and CCD, I uncovered something kind of remarkable that, although well intended, the continuity of care document um, isn't really something that allows patient data to move across geographies, providers, and EMRs yet. And uh, if you don't have that, the HIE won't help you. Um, Optum says they're doing some things with sort of an extended CCD and axolotl. Um, what are you using, and do you see this as a problem when a patient moves between, you know, a clinic and ambulatory center, uh, your practice, and the hospital you're affiliated with? 
I'm going to take that one and give you an answer to an answer or a question to a question. You know, one of the things that, is, as I stated there in the bio, is really, truly, this was an issue of if you build it, the technology will come. And so we're looking to all of you for that. So ironically, you mentioned a couple of names that I actually do have familiarity with, and we're using the, uh, the Optum Insight piece as far as our, uh, our HIE. We're also using the backbone of, of the direct protocol through SureScripts. And so while I can't answer the technical aspects of what's there, what's in compliance, um, we're very optimistic this will be what we're looking for. So one of the questions lend itself to sort of outcomes. I mean, it's one thing to have the information, but how do you engage? Well, how do you make it meaningful? One thing we don't talk about a lot so far is reimbursement. So for any of you, I mean, is, is, is the future that we're all envisioning here dependent on a change in reimbursement? Uh, for physicians or pharmacies or otherwise, or is this going to happen even in the absence of a change in reimbursement? Yeah, I, I, oh, go ahead. I personally don't think it's a reimbursement issue. I know a lot of people say, well, I don't want to communicate on email because I'm not getting reimbursed. Um, the reality is you don't get reimbursed for phone calls. You need to communicate. It's a responsibility that we have. So I think reimbursement is not part of that picture. Uh, even though I know it's brought up time and time again. Yeah, um, so, so from a pharmacy perspective, uh, you know, a couple of things that I want to comment on, on patient engagement. 85% uh, of the U.S. population believe that they're healthy. And in order to get somebody to engage is for them to accept that they need some type of assistance or some type of care. And one of the things that we find is that the biggest challenge, whether it's a physician, hospital or a pharmacy is to have that patient accept that there is a clinician that needs to provide them with care. 67% um, of the population report that they are within weight guidelines, yet 75% of the folks are above those guidelines. There's a lot of contradiction in, in what we're seeing. So in order to engage patients, the first thing you need to do is to break through that barrier to help them understand that they need help. Now, as far as reimbursement is concerned, reimbursement, in my opinion, needs to change. Here's why. We have been going after fee-for-service for years. That has been the model. And you could, we could all sit here and say, well, that's a great model. We all make a lot of money. But the outcomes have not improved uh, from a population health standpoint. Uh, whether we go to a outcomes-based uh, payment system, um, uh, ACO is trying to get there. Uh, the, at the end of the day, we have to pay, whether it's a pharmacist or a physician or a nurse or a hospital system, based on what outcomes they actually deliver, uh, rather than simply saying, here's a transaction that I completed and here's what I'm getting paid for. It. I think if we go down that path and we continue to go down that path, we will never see this healthcare system change in its entirety towards the right path. Uh, so reimbursement has to change, and it has to be a, a shared risk as to how we get patients to feel better. And I want to add another perspective to that. Coming from my health insurance past, I think the incentives for patients have to change also. Uh, the panelist from Geisinger during the super session yesterday said something that really resonated with me because this has occurred to me so many times. That 30 minutes of exercise you should be getting, well, if you're not doing it, it's going to cost you 500 extra dollars a year. Right now, patients feel like it costs $20 to have a baby because a lot of times it does to them. Employers are paying a big chunk of their health care premiums, but as we start to see these uh, health plan models change, I mean, I personally am on an HSA, and that's all my employer offers. And wow, it was very different going from, you know, having to pay a copay to now when I go to the doctor, I pay 100% out of pocket, right? And I think increasingly we'll see more of that financial burden shift to patients and they'll start thinking more and more about how they're consuming care and what it means to be healthy and what it means to be sick. So. I agree. I'd add one more thing. I had a very interesting conversation with the think tank at CMS in their Million Hearts campaign. And one of their premises was this, if we could actually couple achievement of goals with your copay. So if you come in and have your blood pressure checked as you fill your prescriptions and you're in goal, they give you a zero copay on your prescriptions for generic prescriptions. I thought, wow, what a revolutionary thing. That is what would change healthcare consumerism. If you achieve these goals, you stop smoking, you take an aspirin and you're actually controlling your lipids and we will write off your physician visit code. 
And so I think there's models out there. I, my hope is these ACO models will incorporate that level of achievement because right now that's what's broken. There's no hook if you do or hook if you don't. And I say if your blood pressure is not controlled, you're not taking the meds, fine. You can pay the $35 copay to come see me. But yeah, if we can get you to the goal of control, fine. Let's talk about how that can be done with an appropriate agency that will, will take a lead. Interesting. Hi, I'm Tammy Lewis, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Haptique. And uh, for, I guess, full disclosure, I should say I was once the Chief Marketing Officer of SureScript, so I really believe in what SureScript is doing, and I, I think it's a terrific panel. Um, so right now, you know, talking about patient engagement, I think Nihik did a great job in putting that framework together. I think it's so important and that so many people could benefit from that roadmap. Um, in my new role, you know, looking into the future, once looking at a point where doctors would prescribe electronically, we've come so far from that before the first prescription went over uh, the SureScripts network, I now in my new role will be looking at doctors eventually prescribing mobile health apps to patients. And while we, you know, I think it's a great thing and that's why I'm excited to be doing what I'm doing, but the re what I really am looking at also is the patient engagement and getting from download to utilization and based upon the population that will likely benefit the most from mobile health apps, we still will have the challenge of adoption and utilization for the difficulty. So I was just curious of some of your thoughts and comments on that um, in terms of having usage of, of mobile health apps you know, by the patient population. Well, my experience, and I've tried several, uh, you know, the labs have given me the apps that, that, to connect, and the developers of those apps, I don't know, something, it, utiliz with an intelligent populi population, utilization isn't as seamless as I'd like it to be. And again, I haven't looked into why not, but when I go back and I've met with the folks from the lab who are, the, it's still, they, they can't tell me why not. I say call them, and it's a burden to call to work through it. So when you guys are developing, when you're developing these apps, you have to do the work to look at all the populations to say this is as easy as turning on the TV or using a remote control and to get your goals because you have restrictions from the government and others that, you know, things have to be done with certain passwords, et cetera, but you have to make it easy and seamless. And I don't know how to do that, but that's key. So I, I find it, it, I think it's an interesting comment. And just um, what Hepsic is doing, we, we're not an app developer, but we are going to be certifying health apps. So you're, you're touching, I think, a very interesting point about the usability. And that's not something that we've looked at, but I think from a practical standpoint, whether it's us or somebody, looking at the usability of those apps will be important. I'll actually add a ditto on the seamless. I think from a provider standpoint, it needs to be appearing as a single application to us because we're portaled out. Like if another a single salesperson shows up in my office, I have a great software that you can log into and have another password and pin. Like I'm just going to kick them out. Like I've had enough. I want one thing to function with my EMR on my desktop in a single display, and I don't want to have to go 18 places to do that. And that's going to be important as the industry moves forward. Final question. Um, you, you were mentioned. We were talking about. Um, uh, reimbursement models and, and whether or not they needed to change and, and how um, some people think that doctors won't won't use this stuff unless they're being paid for it. And, and I think that I think that a big part of that is is that they believe that they really are going to have um, this phone ringing in their pocket constantly and they're thinking, well, you know, if I could spend 10 minutes a day contacting my patients, no big deal, but what's going to happen is I'm going to be constantly be, be be talking to these patients over, over these devices and because of that I'm going to need to get paid because if, otherwise I'm not going to be able to see my other patients. And so the, it, I think there's a, there's a crossover between those two concerns. Uh, the other thing is uh, I'm, a clinical, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and we're supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be sending patients home with homework. Uh, we call it homework, uh, discharge instructions. And almost nobody in the clinical psychology field actually sends patients home with discharge instructions. We're supposed to do it every single time any patient leaves our office. We're supposed to have, you know, questionnaires handed to them and, and instructions, and it just doesn't happen because there's just too much, it's too much uh, of a workflow disruption for us. And so um, I, I think that um, because of that, um, I, I'm acutely aware of the fact that, that it's, it's always, it's, it just eats up all of my time to sit there and be and be to be doing this, and so they're scared to death that's going to happen. I think our experience is the same, 
that it's not what you're saying is we don't find ourselves burdened with a, 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 a thousand questions. What I do is I answer the question. It's got to be quick and simple. If it requires, a de and yours might be different because your patients may be more complicated, but if it's complicated, if it's a complicated issue, frequently I have the patient come in. I feel that I'm better served. They're better served. Uh, so I don't feel burdened with the questions, and I deal with them just like I would on a phone call. Some I say, I can't deal with this now. Please come in. I'll write you later. So I find it facilitates my care and doesn't add a burden. And uh, the second question or part, and he does a great job with instructions. I do. I feel a good job with instructions. And the, re the way we do it is it's automated. You know, uh, he's not typing up a long list of detailed instructions specific for that patient. It's automated and comes out for me. They have a urinary tract infection. I've given them this medication. I've already developed my own. I press a button. Here are your instructions. And I feel it, it improves their care and makes my job easier because I'm incapable of giving them all the information they need. But here now it's written out. So if you... And I, I don't know much about clinical psychology, but I'm guessing that there are many of the same types of things you want to tell people. Just can them and maybe modify a sentence if you need to, and you'll feel much better about fulfilling that. Yeah, I mean, with anxiety, if you could just teach somebody to breathe. I mean, everybody with all the anxiety disorders, they start hyperventilating, and it, it's a big part of the problem. And but you could print that up and say it's universally true that breathing exercises, and here's what I recommend. And that's why I'm here, because I'm founding a startup that's doing that. So. so you are at the same place we were at before we jumped. My rule has been in our organization, you know, we'll jump with both feet, and we'll figure out where the landing is going to be in the future, but it'll help us. And so everybody knows that. We face a new product upgrade. We know it's going to be kind of rocky for a few weeks, and there may not be all the interfaces back up, and that's just kind of the process, but that's jumping. And so now my rule was this, is I always said if I'm going to type something twice, the third time it's a cut and paste into a handout. It becomes a permanent part of the record. And so I don't type it a third time. It's actually automated. And that's been a winning combination for us. We've actually done deep level analysis of what we're doing redundantly and taken out those steps. So I appreciate all your time. You guys have been a great audience and interactive. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.